So let's take a look at cellular respiration in, in more detail. Remember it's an aerobic process with two main stages. Remember that we learned that glycolysis is needed for cellular respiration. And glycolysis, basically split in half, the glyco part is referring to glucose, and lysis means to break. So we're breaking glucose apart. So the products of glycolysis enter cellular respiration when oxygen then is available under aerobic conditions. So basically we have to use two ATP molecules in order to split the glucose molecule in the first place. But in the end, four ATP molecules are produced. You probably remember from our video, Energy In and Energy Out, that sometimes we have to invest ATP in order to make more ATP. But in this case, our return, we actually are getting two more than what we originally started with. We also are creating two molecules of NADH. Remember, these are high energy molecules. And two molecules of pyruvate are produced. And pyruvate are those three carbon compounds. So when we took the six carbon glucose and we split it in half, that's basically the name of the chemical compound that's made, pyruvate. So when we look at the chemical reaction, again, six carbon molecules, we got to use two ATP in order to split that molecule in half. We get two pyruvates, two of those three carbon molecules. NADH gets made, but once that NADH takes on the electrons, four ATP get made. So then we're left with these two pyruvates. So we're looking at where does the pyruvate go after this? The Krebs cycle, just like the Calvin cycle, is the first main part of cellular respiration. Pyruvate is broken down before it actually gets to the Krebs cycle. So I'm going to go ahead and click through these because I want to be able to look at the picture at the same time as we're writing this down. So you can see here in step one, pyruvate from glycolysis is broken down. Okay, so that's the three carbon compound. One of the carbons gets ripped off and it's released as carbon dioxide. That leaves us with a two carbon compound and it, at the same time, we're able to make another <clears throat> energy-carrying molecule of NADH. That two-carbon molecule right here in step two binds with coenzyme A. Coenzyme A does exactly what it sounds like it does because it's an enzyme. It helps speed up this process that otherwise would probably take too long to occur. So at this point, once the coenzyme A is attached, it can enter the actual cycle of, of what we call the Krebs cycle. So the whole purpose of the Krebs cycle is to produce these energy carrying molecules. So notice everywhere in this circle where NADH or other molecules are being formed. NADH is made up here, NADH is made right here, and NADH is made right here but we also are making another new molecule that we haven't heard of before called FADH2 and this molecule is also energy carrying. So let's look at this more in depth. If the whole purpose of the Krebs cycle is not really to make ATP, its purpose is really to make these energy carrying molecules of NADH and FADH2. So these are kind of the, well I shouldn't say these, the intermediate molecule, that two carbon compound that was left over from having carbon dioxide ripped off of the pyruvate, enters the Krebs cycle. Okay, that was step two. That's what we already looked at. It forms what's called a six carbon compound that we know as citric acid. Okay, so that's what's going on right here in picture three. The citric acid then gets broken down, releasing a carbon dioxide, so we're ripping off a carbon. Okay, we're going from 6 to 5, and NADH is made. Pretty easy. Okay, then when we continue, that 5-carbon compound is broken down. Look what happens. We're going to rip one of those carbons off again, releasing carbon dioxide, and this time we make NADH and an ATP. Okay, so this then we're left now with a four carbon compound. So this was, this was step five. 
And then from here, that five carbon molecule gets broken down, another carbon dioxide gets released, and NADH and ATP are made. Oh, I'm sorry, I just said that. That's up here. Okay, so now let's take a look at um, number step six, because step six is where the four carbon molecule gets rearranged. So the electron transport chain, which is the final stage of cellular respiration, uses those energy carrying molecules of NADH and FADH2 to make ATP. Sorry, the dog's looking out the window and he's growling at something. So we've got high energy electrons that enter that electron transport chain. The energy is used to help transport those hydrogen ions, just like the electron transport chain in photosynthesis, across the membrane to an area where there's um, a higher hydrogen ion concentration. That creates potential energy, and as soon as those hydrogen ions want to get out, they have to pass through that special channel in the membrane. They can't pass through the phospholipids. Okay, So what we see is we're using this energy here. When we rip off those hydrogens off of NADH and FADH2, that gives us the hydrogen ions that need to go in, but also the electrons that go in the membrane to um, create that, that energy. So the breakdown of one glucose molecule um, produces up to 38 molecules of ATP. Okay, pretty impressive. Now, here's how that ATP actually gets made. Remember the special channel protein was called ATP synthetase. Not synthase, synthetase. This molecule is the enzyme that enables this process to happen. So as soon as those hydrogen ions pass through ATP synthetase, the ATP synthase enables the phosphate to be added to ADP, making ATP. The oxygen out here picks up electrons and hydrogen ions and forms water. So the water is what is released as a waste product. Remember breathing out on the window? So now we're going to take a moment and we're going to look at what happens when oxygen is not available. So in our video, while fermentation is basically the process that's used to make a very, very small amount of ATP, but actually without oxygen, so anaerobically. Fermentation allows glycolysis to actually continue, and that's really important for some of those um, single-celled unicellular organisms that are quite small that don't necessarily need a lot of ATP like we do. So let's learn why fermentation allows glycolysis to continue. So it can, helps glycolysis continue by making ATP when oxygen is not available. It's an anaerobic process. It occurs when oxygen is not available for cellular respiration. But it does not actually produce ATP. So really, what's the point? Right? So the idea here is that following glycolysis, there are two different pathways um, in order to create ATP energy. You can follow the aerobic pathway this way towards cellular respiration that occurs in the mitochondria. Or you can continue in this direction without oxygen and follow this fermentation pathway. So let's learn about fermentation. All right, so NAD, the ion, which is what is left over when that hydrogen is ripped off, is recycled into glycolysis. Lactic acid fermentation in you actually occurs in your muscle cells. Now, glycolysis, remember, splits glucose into two pyruvate molecules, and the pyruvate and the NADH are what enter the fermentation process. The energy from NADH converts pyruvate into lactic acid, and then NADH is changed back into NAD. So let's look at this. If I've got glycolysis occurring, I start with glucose, right? Two ATP are made, 
two NADH are made. Okay? The two pyruvates here move into lactic acid fermentation. <clears throat> In this process, the two pyruvates are converted into lactic acid, but in doing so, rip away that hydrogen ion and form NAD. So NAD can go back over here to help split more glucose. So note, in lactic acid fermentation, we don't actually create any ATP. Glycolysis is the process that makes ATP. So if a single-celled organism gets stuck right here and only has pyruvate and can't change this NADH back into NAD, as soon as they run out of NAD, they have no way of making any more ATP. This is why fermentation is so important to those single-celled organisms like bacteria and yeast. So some of those products, remember, are important in several different ways. Alcoholic fermentation is similar to lactic acid fermentation. We've got the exact same process. Glycolysis splits glucose and the products enter fermentation. The energy, the energy from NADH is used to split pyruvate into an alcohol and a carbon dioxide. And then at the same time, NADH is changed back into NAD. The NAD then gets recycled to glycolysis. So when we look at this diagram, it looks exactly the same as the lactic acid fermentation. It's just the end products are a little bit different. So we start with glucose. NAD forms NADH, creating two ATP. The two pyruvates move into alcoholic fermentation, where two NADH get converted back into NAD that then can be recycled back into glycolysis. But in the end, instead of making two lactic acids, they make two alcohols and two carbon dioxides. So remember that fermentation is used in food production. Yogurt was one example that we talked about in class. <clears throat> cheese is another one. When you eat blue cheese, you are literally eating those the, the fungus and bacteria is used also. And then bread. So we've got yeast and bread. So, mmm, yummy cheese. You can tell we're from Wisconsin, can't you? <laughs>